Hey guys, I'm Gene Del Sala, president of Audiholics, and today we have a special treat for you. We're in Lawrence, Kansas, visiting Martin Logan on location, and we've got two Joes with us. We got Joe Voico and Joe McCracken, and they're going to give us a rundown of what they do and what Martin Logan does at this facility. So why don't we start with the Joe to my right? I'm Joe Voico, and I uh, design electrostatic speakers like this one. That's about it. That's it. <laughs> No design specifics. What do you do? You play with uh, test instruments. What kind of equipment? Well, do you we use? we we measure them with uh, microphones. Uh, we have custom software we use that took a lot of time to write, and we use that to compile results. Then we bring that all into um, a mathematical program that allows us to figure out what filters will make the speaker sound good. Then we do board layout, design the crossovers, put it all together and play it and then tweak it and make it sound really good. So you actually tweak it in a room like we're in right now. It's like a kind of a real room. You're testing it. It's not, you know, an atypical room of what a consumer would use, right? No, it's a, yeah, it's a typical room. We got carpeted floors, uh, sheetrock walls. Um, we do have some room absorption panels around here roughly equivalent to a bunch of couches and curtains. Uh, I, it's not untypical of what might be in someone's living room in terms of acoustic, an acoustic signature. Sounds good. Okay, what about you, Joe? So uh, I also work on electrostats, um, but my main focus has been a lot of the motion products that have uh, come to uh, fruition in the recent years. Uh, but there is a lot of overlap between what uh, Joe Voico and myself do. Uh, some of the bigger projects, we tend to have a lot of lot more overlap. It takes a lot more effort. Okay. Um, I wanted to go over a little bit about how an ESL panel works. Maybe you could give us a quick rundown uh, for people that are kind of curious. I've always seen people coming in a room seeing a speaker like this. are like, well, how does that produce sound? Because they just see, you know, perforated metal. So maybe you could just give a quick rundown on how that works. Sure. Uh, Joe Voico might be the sure. more resident person for that. So uh, an electrostatic panel consists of uh, uh, two perforated pieces of metal, and in between them is a piece of thin uh, mylo polyester plastic. That's a half mil thick. Yeah, if I remember right. Um, so what happens is we run audio to the two pieces of uh, perforated metal, we step it up through a step-up transformer, so we prevent, pre present high voltage across the gap between the two pieces of perforated metal. And then on the diaphragm, we suspend an electrical charge. So the electrical charge gets suspended in the, um, in the electric field, which causes forces on the diaphragms. Another way to say it is the diaphragm is charged positively, and the audio goes positive and negative on the two pieces of steel. And because like charges attract and different ones repel, the diaphragm moves back and forth in between there. So the diaphragm in the middle is always positive. How is it getting a charge? You have to plug that into the wall or is it getting it from, it's not getting it from the amplifier, right? Right, the charge actually does come from the wall, uh, AC outlet. Our completely passive models use a, uh, an AC adapter to provide the low, the low energy needed to charge the diaphragm. The, speakers that have amplifiers built into them, we just tap into the amplifier's power supply to grab enough power to generate that bias voltage to make the panel work. Now, a lot of people, at least the older designs or stereotype of ESLs is that they're a harder load to drive than a typical cone speaker. Is that true or false, or how does it, how does it differ? It, there's some truth to it, there's, but it's not as bad as a lot of people say it is. Mm -hmm. So the panel, you're driving two pieces of steel through a step-up transformer, that presents a capacitive load to the amplifier. So if you look at the impedance of our speaker, you'll see on the high frequencies, it drops down and goes lower and lower. The good thing is with typical music, there's not a lot of energy at those frequencies. So when you look at how much current gets drawn when you're playing music, how, low, how much we're taxing the amplifiers, it tends not to be a problem in the end. So we played these speakers on a lot of low powered amps, high powered amps. Most amps tend to be able to drive them just fine. 
So you probably want to guys that are into like esoteric cables and tuning their system with their cables, which we really don't recommend. You probably want to stay away from cables that are very high capacitive, right? There's cables that have flat conductors that lower the inductance by sandwiching the conductors, but they give you massive amounts of capacitance. Yeah, the capacitance of a cable like that is much less than the capacitance of our, our speakers. One of the interesting things about the speakers, though, is the transformers in between the panel capacitance and the amplifier. And that actually, above about 25K, that actually changes the load to inductive. Oh, okay. So the amplifier sees that low impedance peak at 20 to 25K, but then it starts going back up. And that's why I a lot you. of amplifiers stay stable. Right. Because if you hooked an amplifier to a straight up capacitor, it's probably gonna not be happening. Well, yeah, and a lot of amplifiers put a very small inductance on the outputs for the stability. Right. So, right. okay, that's interesting. Um, can you tell us about the curve of the panel? What's the significance of it? Other than it looks cool and it looks, you know, right. nice and raised. Well, the panel, the curve is actually a full 60 degree arc. Um, and in our specs, we say that it has a 30 degree dispersion window. The full 60, you can't actually use that. You need a little bit of that angle to fill in before the sound becomes usable. So although the curve is a full 60, the listening angle is a 30 degree window. That's okay. So it basically widens your sweet spot so you're not narrow, like a lot of the right. older designs were very focused into one specific right. sweet spot. Yeah, but if the panel was completely flat, you would have to sit perfectly still, or if you moved your head, the high frequencies would go away because all the sound waves on a flat panel would only add up at just one spot out in the distance. Gotcha. Well, that brings up another topic I, that's kind of been on my mind. You know, we've been doing a lot of research on room acoustics with our videos and with our articles. And there's a lot of science that says you need to have a speaker that has a very consistent uh, sound power with similar off axis to on axis so you preserve your early reflections off the sidewalls. You almost don't even treat the sidewalls with absorption. And then it adds the spaciousness at the listening area. Well, if I'm understanding correctly the way these panels work, because you've got the positive wavefront in front of the panel and the negative wavefront behind the panel in a dipole kind of configuration, you're deliberately controlling off axis of the speaker. There's almost no sound coming from the sides of the speakers. So you're limiting the amount of sidewall refractions and you're not really adding the early reflections to the listening area like you would with a conventional cone speaker. What do you what do you think what are your thoughts on that? I think you described it perfectly. The uh, the off axis of our speaker once you get outside of that 30 degree window, the sound just drops away and you don't get any direct radiation from the speaker. And I think the best way to experience this is to listen to our speakers, listen to uh, cone and dome speakers. And typically on the cones and domes, you get this bunch of spacious stuff going on. You listen to ours, you're going to hear focused sound that's very clear. And we like the ways ours sound. I guess, guys, it really comes down to a matter of preference and a matter of listening conditions in your room. Because I've been in rooms, I've been to both schools of science where you want your room to be as natural as possible with all the echoes. Then I've been to rooms that are overly acoustically treated. And I'm kind of in the middle myself personally, but I've seen people like one approach over the other. It really comes down to no matter how much science you have, it really comes down to listening preference and you having to sit down and experience the speaker for yourself. I mean, there's other advantages I think you were talking about. You still get the back wall radiation that right. adds to the sound stage, right? That's that's correct. I mean, uh, what Joe was saying is absolutely true. You know, we do focus the sound. You get a nice focus sound sitting in that, you know, 30 degree arc, but you do still get some ambience off the back bowl because it is a dipole and there still is radiation mm -hmm. coming back. It's just a, a much more delayed than a, a sidewall. Right. So it is, guys, it is a different experience. You're not going to put a speaker like this in a room and then put it like a Paradigm S8 in the room and get the same type of experience. It really comes down to your room acoustics and what your preferences are. And it, there's nothing wrong with one way or the other. That's why we have choices. That's why there's over 400 speaker companies just in the U.S. alone, right? That's right. Okay, so what I'm wondering now, I want to know what's new at Martin Logan. So maybe you can give me a rundown of what you're working on. So one of the new things we just developed was the uh, base um, system for the Masterpiece series, the Renaissance Expression and Impression. Uh, one of the things we did is we have powered woofers with a DSP preamp. 
and that allowed us a lot of flexibility in how to make the base system work. Um, so not only do we have the base system, we have some knobs on it that mm -hmm. you can turn the base up and down. If you like a lot of deep base, you can turn it up and make it do what you want. If you don't like that, you have the opposite. There's also a mid base adjustment, which is also can depend on the user preference, size of room, just how things are integrating. If you feel you need a little more there or less there, you have control of that. One of the other features we have is the powered force forward, which actually directs space into the room and away from the wall behind the speaker. And we found in the past that the reflected base towards the wall behind the speaker can have a, can cause a frequency response anomaly that's really not that good. And by directing the base forward, we eliminate that problem. Hmm. Is there a Anthem Arc technology in, involved in this, like room correction? Are you using any of that? In, in, in uh, we do have room correction. Um, it does work with the Anthem Arc system. Uh, you can download it from our website. Um, you hook them up, you can hook them up two at a time um, and run through the ARC system and do the measurements and then uh, there's a switch on it, you can try it and see if you like it better or worse. Um, we've had really good results with it, I think it sounds phenomenal. Will it interface with, uh, I know Anthem just announced they have the mobile app now where you can do ARC over that, Is that would that work with that or no? Uh, at this point in time, no, it's not, I'm okay. not ready for that. Okay, yeah. sounds interesting. So Joe, what are you working on, man? You can't just be on the sidelines doing nothing. Oh, well, um, we're always uh, evolving uh, the motion series and, and other products, but I've been working on the, uh, the uh, classic and Electromotion X. So we've uh, uh, taken uh, the Electromotion speaker, which has been uh, highly popular, and made a, uh, a dual woofer version with a little slightly bigger panel, get you more output, more power, um, and then the classic to help uh, be that uh, gap piece between the masterpiece uh, powered base sections and the electromotion uh, lineup. So it's a it's a passive version of of the higher end models, basically. So that, that's what I've been working on for the electrostats. Okay, sounds good. So when is all this stuff coming to market? Can I pin you guys down on a date, or is it still in development? It's all shipping. Uh, uh, the only thing that's uh, still to be shipping are a couple center channels. Excellent. All right, guys. Thanks. We're in Kansas visiting Martin Logan, and we're with Devin Zell, the marketing manager for Martin Logan. How you doing, Devin? I'm doing great, Gene. Thanks for coming out today. Awesome. Now, Devin, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, because I've been touring your facility here, it seems like you guys take a lot of pride in customer service and customer support. Why don't you tell me about some of that and what makes Martin Logan kind of differentiate itself from some of their competition? Um, we do indeed take a great amount of pride in customer service and support. Um, what you out there on YouTube will not see is the, the racks and racks of service parts we maintain uh, that are actually just behind the camera that's filming this. Um, and we have service parts that go back to day one. There are many products that we've built as far back as 1983 that we still have inventory for. Uh, if something comes back so we can fix a crossover or a woofer. Um, now I can't promise that every crossover component or woofer we've ever used in 35 years is on the rack, uh, but we go out of our way to maintain those service parts uh, far beyond uh, where most other manufacturers would. Uh, there are very many instances where we do get products back in that are 25 or 30 years old and we're able to go back and get parts for those products and bring them back to life. Um, but what I've allowed Gene to watch, and I didn't allow him to videotape today, uh, was something that's rather unique to us. Um, and that's that the major component of our product, the electrostatic panel, we can still build brand new electrostatic panels for products that we built 35 years ago. So we're not going to a dusty bin of electrostatic panels that were built 30 years ago. Um, if a service order comes in and somebody wants to fix up their electrostatic uh, speaker that finally after 35 years may have failed for any number of reasons. We we're able to pull out fresh metal, fresh adhesives, fresh materials, latest generation diaphragms, and we will sit down and hand build a replacement part uh, after the order is placed. So you, you want a service stat, you're going to get something brand new that's handmade today. And the cool thing about that, like you said, um, 
if you have the opportunity to rebuild an older speaker, you have the newer engineering materials in some cases, like the newer diaphragm material. Mm -hmm. So the customer will wind up getting that speaker back sounding better than it did the day he bought it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It, it's unheard of, I think, for, for any high-end company to have the ability to provide such uh, fresh manufacturing for service parts such as that. Excellent. Well, guys, you heard it here. If you have old Martin Logan speakers that are collecting dust that don't, you know, no longer work anymore, give them a call because there's a chance that you could have it serviced and even get it better, you know, working better than it did the day you got it 20, 30 years ago. So remember that and keep listening. Hey, guys, I'm Gene Del Salle, president of Audio Hawks. And today we have a special treat for you. We're in Lance, uh, look. <laughs> Just hit stop.